Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Get Real with Ned and Lisa Burwell. Thanks for joining us today. Today's topic is a uh, is a topic that's pretty pretty heavy, and it's it's something that maybe not a lot of people know about Lisa. And in light of the the name of the podcast, Let's Get Real, Lisa's going to get real. She wants to share with you with you some of her journey. And I will uh, turn it over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Ed. So what's today's topic? (laughs) Today's topic is the great big giant topic of addiction. Okay. Uh, I, it's actually, um, it's very freeing to be able to share this with everyone. Most people do not know this about me, even though we have it on our You Matter site. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I went through, through decades of addiction and it, it definitely negatively affected my life, and I've been through a journey through of consciousness to come out the other side with it. Yeah. And uh, so, if we back it up to the beginning, um, how did this addiction form? Like like many other people, I had an injury that led to surgery or post surgical healing. I had an operation on my knee, and at first I was very against taking anything for it. Mm-hmm. But back then, I was 16, I think, um, and they'd always say, Lisa, you need to take your pills, you need to take your pills, even yeah. if I didn't want it. And uh, eventually it overrode my, my own voice to not take them. Mm-hmm. I just did what I thought I should. So this addiction that I didn't even know I had, many, quite a few years into it, I absolutely did not realize it was an addiction. Yeah. Um, uh, I also was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, so I had intense disease pain, a, a bowel disease. Yeah. So I, as far as my family and I knew, we were just treating that. And um, as you know, with bowel disease, that rolls on. So it really one thing turned into another. And then at what age did you get Crohn's? That was, uh, the onset was age 15. Okay. And uh, diagnosed at 16. When they were just doing my background, my health history, and asking how many bowel movements I had a day, I'd say 45 to 55. And they said, no, you don't understand the question, how many? And I tell them again, and yeah. um, all things that we, we just didn't know uh, that there was other things going on. So. Yeah. And then so at that, at that point, um, how many pills a day were you taking? At that point, I couldn't tell you. I, I guess whatever the pill bottle said. Okay. Um, and it wasn't until the age of, I believe it was 18, 17 or 18, I worked, do you remember Blantford Square Mall? Yep. I worked there and I was still, uh, although my knee had been, had I recovered from that, uh, I had, I still had a lot of abdominal pain, had this disease process going on. And again, we didn't really know a lot about it then, but I found out that you could buy Tylenol 1s from Woco. Okay. Yeah. I could just go and get my own. So I thought, well, that's, that's better because I can... I can go to a lower dosage or I can add more whenever I want and I don't need a doctor to tell me anything. So that felt like a sense of freedom, which ultimately led me to to feel trapped and... Okay. So then at age, how old were you when... About 17. 17. So that's when you started buying your own pills and self-medicating. Yeah. And then my tolerance got higher and higher. So how did that journey go? So you started out by taking the recommended dose and then how many were you taking after that? Yeah. I believe I was I was still being prescribed uh, the higher uh, prescribed Tylenols as well and then I would, if I remember correctly, I would um, take like little bumps of, of extra in between with these Tylenol ones because they were lower dosage so okay. I thought oh, I could just, I can have less, I'll just have it in between. Mm-hmm. Totally naive to, to what I was actually doing to myself. So then we'll fast forward to when did you end up getting surgery and and what was it when you started out with an ileostomy with your Crohn's? A colostomy. Or a colostomy. Yeah. And then you had another surgery, now you have an ileostomy. Yeah. So at what age was did you have those surgeries? Um, well actually, I, I do, I just want to back that up before, before that. Uh, I had realized that I had an addiction because every time I would try to get off these, I would be so sick. So that kind of deterred me, as well as still having pain. 
uh, I went to, to a doctor and told him I was worried about my liver, very worried about my liver, and I wanted off these. And he said, it's, it's just Tylenol 1s. You don't need to worry about that. So um, he didn't help me there. That's when I lived in North Bay. Um, I seem to remember 1999 was my first surgery, though. Okay. Yeah. And at which they, uh, they gave me a colostomy that was supposed to be temporary until my bowel healed. And it just took off from there. It got completely diseased. Yeah. And it just ravished it. And uh, it was, they couldn't save it. So mm -hmm. uh, I, at 16, I also died. And they brought me back, uh, thanks to my mom's intuition. She got me to where I needed to be and to emerge. Um, if she would have taken me home like the doctor was, a, the other doctor was allowing me to, um, it would have went very differently, I think. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of trauma going on with my body anyway. Anemia. And yeah. So by the time you, you got through both the surgeries, um, at that point, how many pills a day were you taking? 14 every four hours. 14 Tylenol 1s every four hours, yeah. plus what the doctor prescribed? Or? No. No. So at that point, you were just buying your own? I couldn't even tell you when I was having pre prescription and buying my own. I, I'm really not sure. I couldn't, can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, my tolerance was high, though. It was really high. So 14. Yeah, because I, I... At a time. At a time. Unless it wouldn't work, it wouldn't take care of the pain that I had. And every four hours. Mm -hmm. So that's every eight hours of 28 pills. Mm -hmm. That's that's a tremendous amount of dialogue yeah. to go in your system. And it would always be me asking the doctors um, periodically. I, you know, I'm worried about my liver. Can we check my liver? Of course, I, did, I, did, I wasn't always forthright with every doctor that, that I the longer the addiction went. Um, I was afraid to, to tell them how many I was taking, but I just wanted to know that my liver was okay. And yeah. Occasionally they entertain me and, and do it, and it would always come back that it was fine. I've never had any bad tests out of it. But I, th I just, I think that's astounding because I, I think very much that uh, it could work differently. So then at, at the height of your addiction, how many pills a day would you be taking at that? Like was 14 kind of every four hours kind of were it the max? Yeah. I'd sometimes try to get down to 12 and that was that was um, huge for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so how did, how did your addiction play on you mentally? I felt so much shame. Uh, I just, I, I felt like it, it really messes with your everything about you, right? Yeah. Um, your self-esteem, my self-esteem, was definitely affected. Uh, you feel like you can't, you can't get over other things if you can't even get over this, right? It even felt like every word that I speak, I didn't didn't even come from me or belong from me. I know that sounds very funny, but it, it just felt like it was this talking. It wasn't the real me. Okay. And I couldn't be the real me because I couldn't get past this. Because you're you have like this huge elephant in the closet that you couldn't couldn't let out yeah and and how did that how did that affect your life in far as relationships day-to-day -day functioning I, I felt like there was a lot of things that I wouldn't have otherwise done you know I um, most addicts can have had this experience where you've befriended people that maybe you wouldn't have um, or you've settled for things you wouldn't have um, because that person isn't judging you or they don't seem to be so you I don't know there's a lot <laughs> yeah uh, even even like curbing the things that I would do because I have to be close to a pharmacy that I can get these from because I'm literally going through a bottle a day and it came to the point where they they started documenting people's names yeah. whenever they bought narcotics and so I couldn't go in there back to back um, or they limit me, they tell me like a, a bottle of 50 and I'm, I'm already, all I can think about is how am I going to take care of myself before tomorrow morning. Yeah. So I've missed out on things because of it. And 50, like that, that wouldn't even be a full, you know, a full Not a full base. day. No. Yeah. No, so then I'd start being sick. And I, really a, a lot of this was just, I just didn't know how to do disease pain still and be sick. And even after I had my final surgery that, that took care of everything, I had a, an ileostomy and they took my entire large bowel. That was 
an intense healing. But when the disease was gone, I still, I, my, it, it's like people that weigh, weigh a lot mm -hmm. and they lose the weight and they still feel fat. Yeah. You know, that the brain is so trained to, mm -hmm. to still be stuck on, on these things, so. And we, whatever we do, you know, it's, it's not just the physical addictions that yeah. we have to drugs. Uh, whatever we do repeatedly, we start to feel normal in that. And if we don't complete that action, we don't feel right. I know, I, I was so uncomfortable when I realized I wasn't in pain anymore. I was so, I was so uncomfortable even when I quit, quit the addiction, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I remember when you and I first got together, you know, yeah. at first I didn't know that you, you had any kind of an addiction going on. But you and I, would, we'd go to a restaurant and you'd start getting antsy and then you'd have to go to the bathroom and you'd come back and there was like this instant noti noticeable change. Mm -hmm. So obviously when you took the pills mentally, you started to feel better already even like before, yeah. before the pills kicked in. Security, I felt secure. That yeah. I'm, I'm okay for the next four hours. And, and I, I could see that happening many, many times. And I, I finally just confronted you. I'm like, I'm like, what's going on? Like, you're, you change Yeah. Like every four hours. I just simply remember, I think we were at, a, um, at a, a Chinese restaurant, weren't we? We were. And I remember feeling um, just falling into this stupor and my eyes were closing. And um, of course, I'm, like I'm with the most important person ever. Yeah. And, in my mind and uh, and that I just couldn't stop what was happening and that's really it was so severe that day you noticed yeah and it was it wasn't predictable for me because sometimes I'd take it and I would feel I would feel so high in a good way right yeah um, I would feel so physically good and then I could take the same dose the next day and be half unconscious so yeah, yeah. and and so I I remember the point where um, you finally told me what was going on. But you weren't allowed to speak about it. Mm -hmm. Every time he would speak about it, I would I would just, like, I don't think I've ever gotten angry at you, but except for that, mm -hmm. I'd be so angry. He wasn't allowed to speak of it. I would just, it would push on my my buttons. I was so fearful. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's funny you say that because when you told me, I, I think most people would be very afraid. When you told me that you were taking 14, Yep. pills every four hours yeah in in that moment I could honestly say I wasn't afraid yeah I had no fear in my body yeah I just said okay that's what we're doing and that's, that's what you're doing yeah <laughs> that, that did amazing things for me mm -hmm. you didn't you didn't um, try to bring your consciousness down to where mine was yeah you know? and I, I think that's a that's an important point and, and we talked about this during um, recently we did a talk at, at the grocery store and we were talking about suicide and we said how when, when somebody's in, in grave danger or they're, they're suicidal that when, once their parents find out they just fall, up, they fall apart or they, they start to be, they become fearful and then they project that fear onto, onto their children. Yeah. So in that moment uh, I knew that back then, I, 10 years ago, I knew that if I project fear onto you, that I, I wouldn't be helping you. And it would actually just make me powerless. You mm -hmm. know, it, it'd take away any power that I had to help you, to support you, to love you. Mm -hmm. and, be, and that's the thing about fear is that it, it resides so many levels below love. Right. You know, and, and I, I still remember there was this defining moment when I just, I, I can't remember the, the exact day, but I remember the whole experience. Mm -hmm. I asked you, I, I knew that you were, you were feeling a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. Over I, I couldn't have felt worse, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have that for you. I, I didn't, all I had was nothing but love, mm -hmm. unconditional love for you. And so I remember asking you, distinctly asking you, 
do you feel shameful? Do you feel guilt? You just said, yes, I do. I feel incredibly shameful. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment... I seem to remember crying. But I, I, I do re I remember you broke right down. And so I went and got a chart of, of emotions. And the, the chart was put together by uh, David R. Hawkins. Mm -hmm. He's a world famous psychiatrist who went on to become a very enlightened guy. And so he, he calibrated all the different emotions. And shame and guilt, the problem with them is that they're at the very bottom mm -hmm. of that list. You can't, emotionally, you can't go any lower than shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. So when I asked you that day, are you feeling a lot of shame and a lot of guilt? And you said yes, and you broke down. Mm -hmm. I knew that you were at the very lowest that a human could go in, in their emotions. And so I went and got this chart and I, mm -hmm. I showed you. If you're, if you're going to take those pills and put them in your mouth, what I feel is most important is that you love them. Love yourself. Don't shame yourself. Don't guilt yourself. And, and it, was, it was such a, a pinnacle moment. Mm -hmm. I'll let you kind of take over from well, here. Thanks. I, I actually remember that happened. Ned, were, Ned and I were going to Cuba, and I remember I, I couldn't, I wasn't able to get there with loving putting it in my mouth. All of a sudden, I couldn't put it in my mouth. And this is, this is just crazy amazing. It shows the power of shifting your consciousness and what it can do. Uh, because for 25 years, I tried everything. I spent so much money. I, I begged people, I did everything to just to try to get help for myself, even if they didn't know all the details. Um, nothing would seem to move this for me. I couldn't shift it until then. And I when I went to go put it in my mouth, it just made me so sick. But I had to still swallow it. I remember you said, take one every hour. And, um, and I got off it, it was about a week, week and a half. But I had to keep taking it um, because I had to get on the plane. I had to get home, but everything in me, as soon as I shifted that consciousness, and I will always be grateful to you for that. And, and I think that's a, a testament to um, just understanding that you could no longer, you were, you no longer allow yourself to go into shame and guilt. And, and if, if there's people mm -hmm. out there that are struggling with any kind of addiction of, of any sort, you know, I, I think it's an important to, to, to be conscious that these are the lowest emotions that we'll, we'll ever get into. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing in that moment, what's more important than the, the addiction itself is to love yourself. Yeah. Because if we, if we continue to hold the shame and the guilt, we can never get in a place where we have enough strength to overcome the addiction itself. I, I did have to keep that um, that in mind as I was moving through trying to forgive myself. Now that I really saw what I had done, um, even though I didn't intend to do that for years on end, uh, I had to forgive myself for for hurting for hurting myself so much. I had to not not continue in that same consciousness though of shame and, and guilt. And, yeah, and I do have I have great compassion for anyone that is an addict or has family that is um, it, because I know it wasn't in my consciousness it like I I couldn't get out of it until I shifted my consciousness but that's that's a lot of other people too they they people think it's it's um, it's their huge decision to be like that and it, it might just be that they're not conscious they're not fully conscious of, of what what else there is right yeah in in all like different addictions have different scenarios that would oh, play yeah. out in, in a, such a different way. For sure. It, you know, and not to negate uh, the importance of rehab and, Absolutely and the addictions programs that are, are currently out there. But in this in this scenario, you, by abandoning that guilt and shame, mm -hmm. reaching into love mm -hmm. and, you know, and having a positive loving support who didn't go into fear, it just seemed like it was the right mix for you to, to grab some self-empowerment. It wasn't easy either. Like I remember it still took another year for my brain to rebalance itself. I, I'm honestly, I'm so incredibly proud of you. 
Thank you. You you just uh, you have so much beauty and strength in you that it, it overwhelms me to get to be the guy that sits beside you uh, every day. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. I, I can't even imagine if you hadn't done that for me then. Um, I, I've always seen you in, in a much bigger light and You've always told me that. And even back then. Yeah. So in and if you if there's anybody out there and you have a friend or a family member who may be struggling, um, what what advice would you tell people? I, I feel like um, isolating yourself is not the not the thing to do. Um, if you can surround yourself even with one person that, that can see your light, do that. And also know that if you're stuck in it and you feel like you can't get out, there is there there are things like, like changing your consciousness. There are other things that you can do that and don't don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Just just do do what you can and do what you have to do to get out of it. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for letting me share that finally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm I'm wondering how many people will be surprised when, when they hear that you had such a long, like a 25 year addiction. I've heard that again and again. People say, oh my God, not you. You of all people. Yeah. I'm just like, a, I'm just like everyone else. Yeah. And my journey started innocently with, with a health issue. And I know that even with Oxycontin, I had two stints with that that were two addictions with that. I and mean, it just seems to come with the, with that. That kind of thing, right? That's right. Like you can. It doesn't. You don't have to be like um, a certain kind of person for that to happen to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> love you, babes. I love you too. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for mm -hmm. watching. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Lots of love from both mm -hmm. Lisa and I. Thank you. <laughs>